Hi, I'm Linda Van Hart, Visual Arts Coordinator for Common Ground on the Hill. Welcome to week three, second gallery talk. Tonight, there's going to be a duet between Keith Taylor and myself. We'll be talking about issues of craftsmanship. We'll be talking about the traditions that have inspired the things that we're passionate about. And we'll have a discussion after the two presentations about uh, several uh, issues that really involve any artist in any art form. Keith Taylor, as you know, uh, is one of our weavers. He is a basket weaver. Tonight, he's going to talk with you about the tradition of shaker tape seat weaving. Take it away, Keith. We seem to have a problem. We seem to have lost Keith. Uh-oh, we've lost Keith. Would you well, like to go first? I will, I will go first, yes, <laughs> while we find Keith. Um, as you realize, the last two seasons, metalsmithing, jewelry, the sculpture classes have been absent from our curriculum and they're some of our most popular classes. All those wonderful classes in the Grove Studio, we haven't been able to build the Rose Cabin or build one of those wonderful canoes or fletch arrows. People just don't have potter's wheels and acetylene torches and cross cut saws at home. So we've had to choose things where uh, anyone can participate. And many of our instructors have put kits together to make that happen. So I'm sure Keith talked with all of his students about the supplies that they would need. And in some cases, they order them themselves. In some cases, the teachers have made kits and mailed them. And in some cases, the instructors have delivered the kits to me. And people have come to Off Track Art when I work there to pick them up because McDaniel campus is closed. So Keith is back with us now and he's going to talk with us about the tradition of shaker tape seat weaving. Thank you, Linda. As you heard, my name is Keith Taylor and I am a basket maker by hobby, I guess. And basketry lends itself very easily to seat weaving. I took my first seat weaving class from Joy Shum at Common Ground on the Hill and fell in love with it, took it for several years in a row and um, ended up being offered the class to teach. So this week, my students all started with the basic stool kit. They bought the, the kit and the shaker tape that of the colors that they wanted, if they wanted different colors. Now the shaker tape is a canvas cotton ribbon or uh, tape, um, and it comes in two thicknesses. I kind of prefer the narrower, but I've also even used ribbon. This is a grow grain ribbon that I've used in weaving them. So our students did this project uh, yesterday. They did over two, under two, on this particular stool. But you can do tone on tone. And if I get the light to catch this just right, you can see the pattern that is in there using tone on tone. This is the one that I used the ribbon on. And I liked it because the colors were much uh, more vivid against the black. Um, this red doesn't, they don't make that shaker tape in that color. It's more of a, earthy color. Um, I like to experiment with some different patterns. Most of what you've seen so far have been continuous weave, where the shaker tape is wrapped around the chair all the way around. And then you go back the other way and you weave through it. And you can see the pattern, the way the light is catching it there. You can see that pattern. But this week, I was experimenting with some things with some uh, remnants that I had. So I didn't have enough to do a continuous black from one side to the other. So I knew how many rows I could make. And so I then filled in with the gray in the middle and the same way 
with the blue going this way. But this is still the two over two pattern, the same that you saw on the other. So here's another one with that two over two pattern um, with several colors in it as well. Now, when you do a chair, it's a little uh, trickier because the chair is a trapezoid. It's wider in the front of the chair than it is in the back. So what happens is you're going to then have to weave some pieces in here that don't go all the way around your chair. And that one you can see tone on tone, and that is the diamond. Uh, you you want to make sure that it's centered. So you have to figure out where the center is going to be, both top to bottom and left to right. This one also is a continuous weave with two tones. That pattern is not the two over two. There's over one, under two, over three. Last year, as I was teaching the class, I tried something new that it, it's new to me in seat weaving, but it wasn't new to me because as a basket, I've done what's called the chase weave where you are weaving two pieces of reed at the same time. So I took two pieces of shaker tape and put them side by side, the wider blue and the narrower tan. And as a spiral, it went around. And it wasn't until I started going the opposite direction with those two that I realized, hey, look, it creates the chevron pattern. And so it was kind of a happy accident. I was just experimenting. I was just playing um, while my students were working on theirs. And this is what I came up with. Speaking of playing, back in the day when I was in Joyce's class, I said to Joyce, who was the instructor, I said, you probably never get time to just play with the shaker tape and see what it can do because it's a business and you need, it's piecemeal. You need to get the, the project done, get it out so you can sell it, so you can buy supplies and, and do another one. And I was telling her that I, I had this idea in my head and I was just wondering if it would work if instead of it being a continuous coil going all the way around, what if each row was separate, like in basket making, a start and a stop row, which meant I had to nail each one of those as I, as I started and ended. And then what if it was the same going the other direction? So what started out is this is what I would do. I said, and then we could do this. And then we could do that. So we called this our we stole because I kind of had the idea and I was starting it and Joyce was working on it. She was going through her scraps and we then put another row on top of it. So it's like after the whole seat was woven, we came in with the narrower tape on top of the wider and went over and under the first weave. And it created this pattern, which is usually everyone's favorite. If you were going to make this would be the most expensive because of all the amount of shaker tape that you would have to use. You're doing it twice as much for this as the other stools. But these were all remnants. They were scraps that we were going to throw away. They're shorter pieces. So that's shaker tape. Now, like I said, this lends itself to basket making. And there's lots of things that you can weave in a basket. So we've been weaving reed. This is the inside of rattan. It's stripped down so that it's porous. It can be dyed or it can be natural. And you can take that and wet it, get it pliable like that shaker tape is pliable and you can weave with that. Now most, I when I was gathering my um, examples, I realized that I didn't really do any patterns other than the twill here, the over two, under two, stepping over one. This is like a twill. So I have this one here. And then I also have this one, which I then stained. After it was finished, I went and got an aqua stain and put on this because I moved to the beach and I wanted something that looked like a beach rocker. I have two giant porch rockers like this out on my front porch and this little kid's rocker to go with it. Now, just like the we stole where we applied something later, I took the reed and I wove the stool. And then after it was finished, I took another piece of dyed reed 
and went through and applied this after the stool was done. I also did it with cane. So cane is the next thing that I wanna show. Cane is the outside of the bamboo. It has the bark still on it. It will not take stain. It is natural and will always be natural. So I have done several different things with chairs with cane. The first one is just I wove it, that over under pattern, the twill, and this is the kid's rocker. You'll notice I had a kid's rocker in every style, but I also have this one that Linda <laughs> recognizes as her grandfather's rocker that I did. She brought this into class one year and said, well, this chair, someone can use it if someone comes without a project. And I spied it and I said, yeah, that's mine. I'm going to do it. It was missing a rocker. My dad made the additional rocker that it needed. I did that, that pattern in everything from this doll chair to the kid's chair to the adult chair and even the footstool. Now, cane you can buy in a sheet. It's called sheet cane or press cane. And the back of this rocker is done in that. It's just like putting in a screen. You soak it. I soaked it in the bathtub. I bought it by the yard, soaked it in the bathtub. And then there's a groove that goes all the way around this panel and a spline that goes in there, just like if you were replacing your screens at your house. So three panels here and one at the seat. So I did screen cane. And I've always wanted to do the whole cane. So I found a brochure that would teach me how to do it. The thing was I had to find a chair because this has individual holes. And I had to go through each one of these holes. I believe it was five or six times each, but it wasn't as hard as I thought it was gonna be. It was actually kind of fun. So there's another type of seat weaving. Lastly is rush. And this is almost like a brown paper bag that's just twisted and you can undo it. You soak this and get it pliable. And it also comes in different colors. There was a while when country decor was very popular and people would use that paper twist to make bows and things out of. Well, rush can be put on a chair as well and you soak it and the weaving is a little bit different. Sometimes you put cardboard in these triangle pieces to get this angle nice and tight. But I use some of that country paper twist in the blue and experimented by putting it just in the corners of it. And I think there's not too much on the bottom for you to see, just a couple knots where I finished out. Usually it's all about hiding the starting and the stopping points. One of the other things that I did was I found this uh, stool that is, um, what's it called? It's uh, like a craftsman, arts and crafts stool. And it had the original, uh, not the seat. Well, yeah, the seat of it. And it was, it was busted. And, but it gave me enough that I could see how the sides were done. And I was able to take the dyed reed. This was already dyed. This is a flat oval quarter inch reed. And I wove around doing this twist. And I had to twist it. So when I came back up, the right side was up again. So once I went all the way across, then I was able to turn it 90 degrees and go across the other way, creating that over to under two pattern that you see there. Unfortunately, it got one little break in it in the move when I moved down here. And I haven't had the heart to redo that again. So, Seat weaving has given me the opportunity to continue to do the things I love with baskets, which is patterns and colors. My perspective from basket making comes into play when I do seat weaving as well. 
But one perspective that's changed is I had to go from being the student for so many years at Common Ground to being that of the teacher. But I must say, I have been very fortunate the last two weeks with my classes. I've had wonderful students and my seat weavers are so excited. Um, they're probably not watching this right now because they're probably all at Goodwill trying to find other pieces of furniture because they're so excited about wanting to do more. So I guess through all of this, you get to see a little bit of my personality with the color and the patterns and all those uh, elements of art, the rhythm and the balance and the unity that brings all these materials that are so soft and flexible and makes them so sturdy that you can sit on them and they will support your weight. Hopefully you'll sign up for seat weaving and I will see you in person next year. That would be great if that was the case. So with that, I'm gonna go back to Linda. Thank you so much, Keith. I think it's really obvious to our audience that you spend a tremendous amount of time and that over the years you have mastered many techniques so that it's given you the confidence to be experimental and play, as you call it. And that's my approach too. Um, we talked to so many artists and I, I know um, you mentioned when we were talking before this started that some of your current students actually had to get out graph paper and sketchbooks to plan out their count because math is such a big part of what you do. Fortunately, math is not a big part of what I do. <laughs> uh, Keith and I will come back after I've spoken with you a little bit and compare and contrast some of our styles and the, 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 the issues that involve all artists in making really finely crafted products. Um, I've been an artist all my life. I started out as many kids do drawing and painting. I used to make little mud ponies when I had a break from doing garden work and other chores getting the eggs from the chickens and stuff like that. Uh, but predominantly, I was very good at drawing and painting. And that's what was available to us. And those materials were available. So it wasn't really until I got to college that I had an opportunity to experiment a little bit with sculpture. But again, the art department at Western Maryland College was predominantly two-dimensional. It just so happened that Vasil Palachuk, one of my mentors, um, was, was helping a group of children, um, foster children, make some money and they had found a load of stone, soap, soapstone on their property and he would pay them for it and gave me a couple of pieces. And I started carving. Uh, as I went to my grad program at Towson University, the watercolor class I thought I was gonna take was full. And a buddy of mine said, sign up for jewelry. Look, look what you wear, look how you look, sign up for jewelry. And it was like falling in love. Everything about it, I was just totally, totally in love with metalsmithing. And that has remained true since 1976 when I first started making jewelry. I had two mentors in metalsmithing. John Fix was the primary, my primary mentor. He was great at hollowware and sculpting. Uh, he was fantastic with forging. That man was born with a hammer in his hand. Douglas Lagenhausen, who at one time had been the representative for Kirk Steef, um, was also a mentor. And between the two of them, I started my collection of tools. I think I, can I go directly to this? And here you see my workbench. On the left-hand side are a bunch of dapping tools. You see bracelet mandrels, a couple of flex shafts on the right-hand side. And here is one of the ways that I save my pattern. Linda, can you try to share again? I'm not seeing it. Oh, 
Uh, how do I get back there? Oh, wait. We Am just, I on still? We just need to go to um, back to Zoom and then go to share screen. I can't find Zoom. Um, hit control tab. Um, or escape out of it and come back to it. I don't know how to do that. Do I end the show? Yes, and then we'll restart it. Okay. Does that bring you back to Zoom yet? Yes, it brings me back to Zoom. Okay, so share your screen. And then choose desktop. And then we're gonna double click that PowerPoint. That one, yes. There we are. There you go. Thank you. So should I start the whole thing again? Can you see the tools? Yes, I can see the tools. All right, this is my workbench. So there are dapping tools, there are bracelet and necklace mandrels. Over on the right-hand side, a pair of flexible shafts and a sketchbook that has a real leaf and then a bunch of my leaf patterns in it. Here are some, but not all of my hammers. A very large set of dapping tools for the bigger sculpture that I do. You'll notice that I use cup holders and I hang my hammers. So I can just, here's my anvil. I got that anvil at a farm auction for $67.50. I was the only woman buying tools and the audience got very quiet when I bid Sixty-seven fifty, because the guy before me had bid sixty-five dollars, and the auctioneer said, "Anybody gonna overbid this woman?" <laughs> and nobody did. And he said, "What I want to know: sold to the lady for sixty-seven fifty." And one guy said, "What are you gonna do with that anvil?" And another guy said, "How are you gonna get it to your car?" <laughs> So I've had it milled twice in the 30 some years that I've had it. You can see that it's mounted on a stump with wheels so I can move it around. Here's one of my two rolling mills. So here's where all the work happens. Down here is my soldering area. You see an upright sander. Uh, there's a buffer in there and one of my two rolling mills. And here is a surround of my entire studio. It's not very big. Two people can work in there, but I fill it up when I'm working. Early on, I started doing uh, grapes. My grandmother was a big fan of grapes. She was a Methodist, so we never had a spot of liquor in our house, but grapes were associated with the Brandenburgs and with Bountiful Harvest. So, I do a technique called repoussé. This is one of the things that I'm well known for. Uh, this is a Cabernet Sauvignon leaf. Uh, I knew that it was a red grape because there was a red row at the end of it at Monticello where Thomas Jefferson planted grapes he was gifted with when he was ambassador to France. And those grapes are still growing. So I cut leaves that were the most perfect specimens to me, traced them for patterns, there's a Cabernet Sauvignon cuff bracelet, and you've all seen the belt that I wear all the time, a Cabernet Sauvignon uh, belt buckle. I do a lot of botanicals. Calla lilies came my way. I get a lot of commissions in this series. I also, this is a silver series with a koi of pearls, but I also do this using vermeil, which is silver that's been clad on one side with 22 karat gold. So as the leaf flips over, you get a bicolored metal that some of my collectors find very attractive. Can't help but do uh, dogwood from back campus. Of course, when Western Maryland changed its name, I had to bring out a new edition of McDaniel dogwood because some of the people uh, wanted to be contemporary with the name. But basically, this is Western Maryland dogwood. And you can see that I have um, remained true to the little notched leaves. This was a moist spring. So these dogwood blossoms are a little plumper than usual. And I've abstracted the center, stylized it so that there are just 
three granulated balls of silver rather than the large group of granulated seeds. I'm wearing one of the members of the Savannah family. I work in a series and the question, what if, is one of the most exciting questions that I can be asked or that I ask myself. I think it's true with every single instructor that comes to Common Ground, no matter what their media, ukulele, clogging, any, any art form, the question, what if, can be so exciting because it leads to an experiment that may become a new part of your personal vocabulary in whatever media you practice. And the Savannah series is one of those. Standing outside the house of the president of Savannah College of Art and Design, I was looking at the biggest Harry Lauder walking stick bush I'd ever seen. And it was draped in Spanish moss. It had little twigs and sticks and leaves and feathers in it. And I thought, ah, this represents the romance of the old South. If I could capture this. And I immediately started thinking techniques. I'm drawing it, I'm photographing it because it's amorphic, because it doesn't have a significant silhouette like dogwood. It's amorphic and it's soft and it moves in the breeze. So once I decided on reticulation, which is this textured metal, granulation, which is the little balls you see on it, diminished diameter forging, three of my favorite techniques, and I started just doing the pieces spontaneously and putting them together. And this series was born. It's one of my best selling, most popular series. And here is the lovely Susanna Herrick Bainbridge, uh, my model for this series. You'll see her in several other slides. And she's wearing uh, a set of the Savannah. You can see I've mixed a Baroque with the Akoya pearls, makes a gorgeous set of wedding jewelry. Another series that's quite difficult, the leaves, the buds, the flowers are all sculpted. There's a lot of, of forging and soldering that goes on in this series based on morning glories. And these are actual size. Unlike our morning glories here in Taos where I was living at the time, a morning glory plant, the entire thing could be this big, dwarfed because of lack of rainfall and high altitude and high temperature. But I love the grace uh, of this series. And you can see that I've done some functional as well as wearable pieces. I'm commissioned to do quite a few baby spoons. And a friend of mine, her daughter, who said she would never have children was living in Albuquerque, living and working in Albuquerque. And when all of a sudden she became pregnant, um, I was commissioned to do a Taos Morning Glory baby spoon for her new baby. Here's, here's Karen Lander, her husband. She loved my Morning Glories and she loved my belt, my Cabernet Sauvignon belt. So she said to her husband, this is what I want for Christmas. So here she is Christmas morning, wearing her morning glory belt buckle. Ivy is also one of the most popular of the series that I do. Each botanical is symbolic. The dogwood, of course, of the emergence of spring and rebirth. Ivy is an everlasting because even in the winter, you can find ivy. If you have to move the snow away from it, it's still there. And it has become a symbol of everlasting love. This is an ivy shrug, one of the first that I've made. I've made shrugs in almost all of my other series. Here's Susanna wearing an ivy pendant with a neck vine and a triple cascade ivy earring. Uh, this ivy earring is not heavy but it certainly does show up. I like rather bold jewelry. This is a one of a kind. Uh, the first year and maybe the second year that I demonstrated at the Waterford Craft Show in Waterford, Virginia, first weekend of October every year annually, and we're live this year. 
I was demonstrating. It was before I came up with the idea of cutting out, pre-cutting a bunch of ivy leaves and letting kids become Miss Linda's apprentice and sculpt their own ivy leaves. So after I, I did enough leaves to make this belt, and this belt is uh, 30 inches, I can still wear it, although I've made it over a decade ago, and no one has been able to afford it, <laughs> but it is, it is for sale. I haven't counted the number of leaves in it. Um, here's, we had a wedding show at Off Track Art, one of my two galleries, and I created some napkin rings for the honeymoon table. Uh, Ivy's very popular um, for home decoration. Here's an Ivy cuff bracelet. Miss Susanna is wearing that necklace. This necklace is special because these pearls come from Beijing, China. And when you hear pearl merchants in Beijing talk about their pearls because there's a certain algae in the lake where these pearls are farmed and harvested, it gives them an iridescence that you just can't match any other place. And when I was in China, these teeny little women that made me look like giantess were wearing these huge necklaces, beaded necklaces. So I decided to imitate that style and made this necklace with those beautiful Beijing pearls. Heart armor um, is probably my favorite series. And I get as many, if not more, commissions in the Hard Armor series as I do in Ivy and Savannah. Um, I was living in Taos, New Mexico and made, I collect harmonica players. And I had collected a new friend and he was in Taos recuperating because the love of his life had walked out of his life. And while we were sitting there talking, I was filing on a milkweed pod. I had sculpted two of them. And you can see that that milkweed pod inverted and became part of this sculpture. I said to John Kerry, I said, you need some hard armor and I'm gonna build it for you. Well, that was 2000. 22 years later, I asked myself the question, what if, and I've never made the same thing twice hundreds of pieces of hard armor later, never gotten the same results intentionally. This is reticulation. This is diminished diameter forging. Right here is change of plane forging. And you can see how it diminishes down this spiral till it wraps down here with this pearl. All of my Mexican fire opals were bought from the representative of the mine who came to my one woman show in Taos. This is about as similar as I get. Uh, a collector of mine said, I love that piece. This piece is ginormous. It's about this big on my body. It's a, it is a tribute to Diego Rivera. That man needed some hard armor and so did Frida Kahlo and I'll show you what I built for her in a little bit. I had a collector say to me, I love the style of this. I love that half of it's reticulated and half of it's forged, but I can't wear anything that big. I'm like, oh, let me see what I can do for you. So in comparing, you can see that I changed scale. The size of the stone is obviously smaller to work with the scale, but I kept the ingredients that she liked in the first thing she saw and made it about half that size. So it's much lighter, it's much smaller and more delicate. Here are the earrings I designed to go with it because the piece is asymmetrical. So the earrings are worn on the opposite ear. This earring is worn on the ear opposite where the curl is on the hard armor. Asymmetry is one of my favorite things to play with. This is the first tribute to Frida Kahlo. Um, and I showed Diego and Frida at Carroll Arts Center. A doctor and his wife were interested in the Frida Kahlo. And I was getting ready to go south for a show. 
they were showing the movie Frida that night. So it was real obvious that I had researched and built a clasp similar to one of the braces Frida had to wear because of the horrible accident she was in as a young girl. So you can see that this is a tussy muzzy mix of apricot pearls of all kinds in with the, the silver. This is the second Frida Kahlo. The doctor and his wife didn't offer me any money for the piece, so I sold it at the next show. And when I got back, there was a call on my answering service that they wanted to buy it. And I said, sorry. <laughs> and it was quite expensive, as you can imagine, with all these pearls. So this is the second one that I did on commission. And with this one, I added some little dangles to it, but you can see that the clasp can actually be worn in the back with the big Diego pe pe um, pendant on the front if you want to unite Diego and Frida as they sometimes were united. I think they were married twice, but they also spent quite a bit of time apart. And here is the third Frida. Uh, it's a little different than the first two, uh, it has apricot coral in with the mix of pearls. And you can see that a cuff has been made with reticulation with the half drilled pearls on top. And I have a close up of this earring, which is diminished diameter forging. This is a heart shield. The heart armors are three dimensional and very sculptural. The Heart shields are very calligraphic. If you saw Janet Kozacek's presentation last night with the Chinese calligraphy, this design is very calligraphic and I consider it one of my strongest designs ever. I just did a series um, of these heart shield earrings and let the person who commissioned me pick the least likely suspect. I was very surprised. I thought sure she was going for these. And I made a smaller pair that were posts and they're the ones that she chose, you never know. Usually when I'm working on commission, I will make several in a series to make sure we get the perfect fit and to give that person a choice because of course I can offer the others for sale. Uh, and in the collections, this is a one-off piece. I was teaching asymmetry, I was teaching because my students don't come to me with the confidence to work spontaneously. So this was towards the end of a semester. And the night that I was doing this, I had all the ingredients assembled, uh, uh, laid out, and some of them assembled so I could make this as a demonstration in front of my students and show them how to balance asymmetrically. And this piece turned out. I took it to the Toledo Botanical Gardens and this gorgeous woman came up and said, gotta have it. And you can see the confidence that she has wearing this very unusual piece. And I find that a lot of my collectors have told me how confident they feel, how many compliments they get when they're wearing my work. Now, how do I get out of this PowerPoint, I end the show, okay, yay. Here we, and I stop screen sharing, stop sharing. I will take our former McDaniel president for example. Uh, Joan Coley is a very flamboyant speaker. And we had a conversation one time about how a speaker, especially a woman, is removed from her audience. And because so many professional women, lawyers, college presidents, politicians, maintain the suited look because it's more masculine, it's considered more professional. Joan and I had this conversation as I've had with many lawyers whom I, I address. Um, when, when you wear a definitive piece of jewelry and earrings of a certain size, even though as a speaker, you're removed by a podium, possibly a stage 
from your audience, but you need to make a significant visual impact. Scale can do that for you. Because I use large sheets of silver to make some of my pendants and, and earrings, they have a much longer viewing depth than smaller pieces of work. And if a woman is going to draw the attention of a crowd and she doesn't have the wit and intellect of Joan Coley, she certainly needs big jewelry. <laughs> Joan and Lee were walking through an airport on their way to Switzerland one time and I had given Lee a group of cards. He said he passed out five of them after they checked their luggage and they were on their way to board the plane. People kept coming over to Joan saying, I love your jewelry. And Lee would say, well, here's one of her cards. <laughs> so that's, that's always a really fun, fun thing for me. Um, I enjoy doing tributes to people that I admire, like Frida and Diego. I've done a series of about a half a dozen pieces. There's one currently, the most recent one, is currently at Off Track Art Gallery as a tribute to Harriet Tubman. And at the entrance to Edisto Beach State Park, there's this ginormous live oak tree. And I got out of the car and was photographing it and realized Harriet Tubman was probably bringing a group of freed slaves right by there on her way out of Savannah going north. And I just imagined that a piece of my heart armor flew into the branches of this live oak tree and went home and created the first tribute to Harriet Tubman. And a friend of mine saw it and he says, well, I hope you really like it because at that price, because it's gold and silver with really beautiful pearls. So they're about a grand two five. And a lot of people don't want to spend that much money on jewelry, but next show out, one of my regular collectors in South Carolina said, gotta have it. And so I went home and built another one. Again, every single one is different than the other. Um, it's significant to people that I travel with who see me drawing these leaves. I've made a lot of jewelry, especially ivy, because it's an international plant. It grows everywhere and it grows in all seasons of the year. And I travel voraciously. So a lot of my travel companions will come to me and say, do you have any of those leaves that you drew in Morocco or you drew when we were in Turkey? And I'll say, sure, what would you like? And then we'll come up with a piece that's, that's a, a, a long lasting memory of our wonderful adventures together as we travel. So my students, I have many students, several who have made their living as jewelers. The, I have many students who put together a toolbox and they make and repair and enjoy making jewelry for the rest of their lives. A lot of my students, I tell them, you're gonna learn creative problem solving when you're with me. And it's gonna make you a more confident communicator. It's gonna make you more confident no matter what your career path is in life. Because once you learn to create a problem solve across the board, you can use it. You can break seemingly impossible problems down to smaller ones, as I have to do, sequencing the steps to make all these complicated pieces of jewelry. And that's what my students learn. They also learn the value of precious metals, gemstones, so that you know, they might not make jewelry for the rest of their lives, but they're going to be giving it, they're going to be receiving it. And it helps them to learn to value the uniqueness of handmade things over mass produced stuff that you get at Walmart or Jared's or any of those mass produced places. All right, so Keith and I are going to talk to you a little bit about the artist developing their personal voice as a signature style. Both of us are working in traditions. Uh, the Kirk Steve tradition in Baltimore is very famous. And, and my work, Douglas Lagenhausen, one of my mentors, worked for Kirk Steve, as well as doing his own independent line. Uh, Keith is working in a tradition, the shaker tape tradition. Um, but within that, we each have our own voice. 
And Keith has shared one of his special things that he even taught his teacher how to do by overlaying different widths of tape. Are there other signature things? Can you show us that one again, Keith? Joyce had never seen anybody do this. And this was Keith's idea. So that is a signature voice. And right. I, consider, I consider Keith an artist. Um, and I consider his works masterfully crafted. So to me, in the shaker tape tradition, that's a piece of fine art. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> well deserved, my goodness, Keith. Um, talk to us about the pattern making your students were doing. My students have to sketch a lot. Okay. Well, I, I suggested that they use uh, graph paper and plot it out knowing how many rows and we were saying we were calling it east west and north south depending on which way they were holding their stool so that they would know if it was odd number of uh rows or uh pieces of shaker tip going across then they have a true center and it's easy to take something like a diamond and place that on the center and work out um if they have an even number then you don't have a true center and it's always going to look a little bit off so to go with a different type of pattern that would be that would show repetition, maybe a zigzag or the twill or um, while this being a twill, you can see the diagonal lines that it creates here. And that way it doesn't matter. You don't have a true center. The one chair that I did show the beige chair had a true center and you could see how that was placed within um, the center of the seat itself. It's coming, my helpers, it's coming. So if I can get this, it's kind of hard to see, but where the light can catch it. And you can see the true center because we have an odd number. Um, just like when, you, when you're working with baskets, you, you have to think of that same thing where you have an odd number so that you have a center, especially like if you want to even put handles on the side, you want to be able to, um, have the same number of spots on both sides plus those in the middle. So odds and evens are important. And we started with the graph paper and then they colored in the ones that they wanted to show. And they were big into um, some diamond patterns today. They wanted to do more like a, um, a star shape, uh, a star burst kind of thing. But then we had to look are you catching enough of the shaker tape to hold it together? Is it, you have to go, I wouldn't go over any more than three um, and then go under so that it kind of secures it because after that, you're just giving a spot for it to catch, for something to catch hold of it and snag onto it. So that was one of the things that we had to alter one of their patterns. It was very interesting because some of the people could see the pattern immediately once it started weaving and they got to the third row and they're going, nope, something's not right here. And some wove the whole thing and there were mistakes throughout in my eye, maybe not in their eye, but in my eye. And so th they couldn't see it. The, the pattern never jumped out at them. One of the things uh, we were in Zoom and I saw one of the one of them holding up their paper with their pattern. And, and I'm thinking, oh, she wants to talk to me. And I keep going, you're muted. You're muted. I can't hear you. And she's going, no, I'm just looking at my pattern on Zoom from a distance because I can see it. If I hold it and I look at the computer, I can see it. But when I look at the graph paper straight on, all I see are the little dots that I've put on there. But when I hold it up to Zoom, I can see the pattern come out clearly. And the other one says, yeah, when you fill the whole screen with your, your stool, it's much easier to see the pattern than if it's back and you have all the background stuff interfering with the pattern as well. So it was very interesting, our conversation on our patterns. But several of them and uh, have, were make, working on patterns today, and they weren't the easiest patterns. Talking about a series that you did, the one has four stools all the same. And she's using the same two colors of shaker tape, but she has a different pattern. So she's done a series of stools using the same colors, but just a different pattern. So that's very cool. Yes. My students do sketchbooks, 
but the most important part of that is so the two of us can look at what they want to make because I'm not a cookie cutter teacher. I teach a technique and everybody can do what they want, different beads, different metals. But the biggest problem is step by step by step. What is the sequence that will lead to success making that piece? And it's funny, I'm, it's not funny, I'm, I'm dyslexic and sequencing is my problem in dyslexia and it, it's disastrous with technology because you just can't persuade and charm a computer. All my life I've gotten away with being persuasive and charming and computers just don't take to that. So technology is a bit of a baffle for me, but as far as a creative problem solver with metal smithing, I can figure out just like that, what you need to do first, second, third, fourth, and help my students do the same thing. That's why so many of them experience so much success and come back and take jewelry to or other classes with me. Uh, I will be teaching jewelry next summer. Uh, I'll have my whole staff back in full force. We will have jewelry making every period of every day of every week that we have common ground. So that those of you who are aficionados of metal smithing can have your way with it next summer. And the same with all our potters and our sculptors will all be back so that we can enjoy a full blown common ground in, in person. I know we are all looking forward to that. And thanks for indulging me um, in showing my, my personal voice in metal and looking so forward to sharing what I love to teach uh, next summer with the rest of you. For our third gallery talk on Wednesday night, we have Gail Matthews, Nancy McKenzie, and Catherine LaPietra talking with you about fiber in wearable and functional art forms. Um, they're a very exciting trio. Um, I have been fortunate enough to be able to pop into the hat, make a hat a day class. And I'm in the process of, I don't use the sewing machine very well. It's kind of like a computer, <laughs> but I'm gonna try. I hand sewed a hat yesterday and I need to be able to use a machine to sew my beret. So we're gonna, we're gonna have fun. Join us tomorrow night for that. Um, on Thursday night, we have another duet. Uh, if any of you heard Sasha Lane the first week, you know her command of the technology of using a camera to the, her best ability is pretty phenomenal. And she's relatively a purist. She sees it, she shoots it the best possible way she can think of doing it and, and does very little manipulation. So we're going to have another collision between shoot straight and manipulate between Sasha Lane and Carrie Wolfson, who's uh, a major manipulator. And then Friday night, uh, we're welcoming back our Scott scholar, Felicia Gee, uh, who's gonna treat us to a tour of her dad's studio. Um, her granddad was the first, the only, for decades, African-American uh, commercial designer, uh, illustrator, and worked as an artist uh, in Baltimore and has continued to be the fine artist that he is and raised an incredibly talented granddaughter. So that'll be our, our Friday night. Hope you can join us for the rest of them. Please don't forget the concert tonight at eight o'clock and every night. And if you were unfortunate enough to miss the gallery talk last night between David Carrasco, Don and Ellen Elms, please go onto the YouTube site and find it. It is awesome. Have a box of Kleenex close to you because these people are doing some incredible work. Um, our new president, uh, Julia Jaskin joined us uh, last night to introduce David, Don, and Ellen, because like so many of us, 
at the core of this common ground family, we were all in school together. We were here in the 60s. And we haven't found a reason to stop doing what we love yet. So that's part of the vibe that you'll get when you're live with us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Keith. What a wonderful talent you have. I appreciate your skill as a teacher as much as your skill as an artist. Thank you. Thank you and good night. Good night.